the Isle of Portland lies shrouded in mists. To some extent, Thomas Hardy's Isle of Slingers still retained some of the mystery of far-off days, when the only link to mainland Dorset was by boat. The island, the Great Limestone Massif, is about six kilometres long and three kilometres wide. It lies with its steepest cliffs in the north, before sloping away towards the south, where the Portland Bill meets the sea. Geographically, Portland is not really a true island, for it's linked to the mainland by a huge bank of pebbles known as Chesil Beach. Chesil Beach stretches some 25 kilometres from here at Chiswell Bay, out west of Bridport Harbour. It partly encompasses the nationally important Fleet Nature Reserve, whose headquarters are here at Ferry Bridge, close to the site of the original crossing point onto the island. beaches pebbles are mostly flints and cherts from Cretaceous rocks and it would appear that these stones have been swept along the beach from west to east with the larger stones probably travelling fastest and therefore being deposited at the Portland end. The smaller stones are a brick board and it's said that local fishermen can tell where they are along the shore simply by the size of the pebbles. Cliffs that seem to rise from the southern end of Chiswell Bay are known as the West Weirs. They reach about 150 metres or so, and some of the scree covering them is natural, but much of it has been added to with waste left by quarry work just inland. There are few areas of woodland on the island, so these around the houses at nearby North Woods hold important trees. All over Portland, quarrying has changed the landscape. Here an old access line has become a green corridor into the heart of the island. There's a fierce tidal race just off the bill tip, and these are dangerous waters indeed. The headland here holds colonies of orcs and gulls, which nest on the protected ledges below a research centre. It's a precarious habitat though, as from time to time the cliffs crack and crumble and the coastline changes. Also visible on these southern cliffs are the remnants of a raised beach. This beach dates back to Pleistocene times and is the remains of a much larger deposit which formed when the Portland and Purbeck rocks stretched far further than they do today. On the slopes above the beach is the old higher light. It and the old lower light, now a bird observatory, were probably built from stone from this nearby quarry. Down on the bill, the newer light took over in 1905 and was manned until recently when its warning became automatic. A visitor centre was opened at its base in 1998. And the bill tip itself is a Trinity House obelisk, a well-known local landmark. And from here the island turns north and east, and by way of a well-trodden cliff footpath, passes fishermen's huts, hoist grains, hut fields, and onto the bird observatory. When the old lower light originally came up for sale, it was in a poor state of repair. Miss Helen Brotherton's father, Eric, who's remembered on this plaque, decided to buy it in the late 50s, and Helen has ever since supervised its renovation and added accommodation for up to 26 people. A major task of the observatory is the monitoring of migration. Its records now go back 40 years and are proving of immense value to scientists and planners. Helen is still the owner and makes regular visits. Here she discusses with Peter Morgan, a regular ringer, the measurements of a recently trapped black cat. The status of insects and their migrations are also monitored, and here Martin Cade, the resident warden, supervises the emptying of an overnight moth trap. Up to six moth traps are run whenever the weather is suitable and records are kept of the Lepidoptera attracted to them. Man has been altering Portland's landscape for more than 12,000 years. This important site at Culverwell, near to the observatory, was probably occupied as long ago as 5000 BC. Culverwell is one of five original well sites and it's not surprising to find that Mesolithic man 
chose a well-watered site close to a source of fish and stones as a home. Archaeological finds prove the presence of people from Neolithic, Bronze and Iron Ages. From time to time evidence of their dwellings have been found, such as this fireside hearth, and much of the land towards the bill is scheduled under the regulations for ancient monuments. A more visible sign of impact, several working quarries are still providing high quality stone for the building industry. Much of today's stone goes to renovate the great buildings designed by men such as Christopher Wren. Portland stone was even sent abroad and used in modern constructions like the United Nations building in New York. These quarries leave vast holes and destroy the original soil. Left alone though, the empty quarries do regenerate somewhat and in time become different but equally important wildlife habitats. In places, accident and design have combined to preserve tiny pockets of original soil. Here in her Southwell garden, Joyce B, a local wildlife artist, has preserved a small piece of old Portland. Plants survive here that no longer grow elsewhere on the island, and insects are plentiful. In a garden we'll return to many times, Joyce finishes a page of speedwells, with a flower picked from her own garden. Returning to the water, we rejoin the coastal footpath as it passes the dramatic cliffs of Chain Weirs, a favourite site for both rock climbers and peregrines. A good example of collapsed undercliff, the weirs are difficult to access, provide cover for wildlife and sites for many flowering plants. Further along, in a commanding position above Church Oak Cove, sits Rufus Castle, evidence of Portland's strategic importance. An irregular pentagonal tower, the castle was built between 1432 and 1460 as a defence against the marauding French. It occupies much of the same site as the now ruined St Andrew's Church which lies adjacent. Church Oak Cove is a botanist delight, scenically very beautiful, as indeed are most of the East Weirs. Further north, from the highest part of the island, by the prison in the Verne Citadel, fine views of the Purbex can be had. Coming around the northeast corner of the island brings into sight the Portland Port Complex and the famous Portland Harbour. The Navy and the Fleet Air Arm have now left the port, but the harbour looks towards a new future as a major site for water sports, such as yachting and windsurfing. As the harbour site is developed for leisure and for residential accommodation, let's hope that planners bear in mind that it's not just Portland's position in geology, but also its land use, that are the keys to its interesting wildlife. Of course, whatever man does, the seasons will still come around. And it's here on the bill that our story really starts. Spring brings flowers, and though early purple orchids can be found at several island sites, amongst the most accessible are those which occur on the short grass slopes of the bill promontory. Occasionally the now much rarer green winged orchid can also be found. This deep purple flower shows distinctive veins and lacks the spotted leaves of its commoner relative. In the fields near the bird observatory, fresh spring growth encourages the local sheep. A number of flowers begin to increase. Charlock is one of the first crucifers to appear, and small clumps proliferate. Over these same fields, the air rings to the song of the skylark, a sure sign of warmer days. Nationally, the skylark has declined by 60% since 1970, losses mainly inflicted by agricultural changes, for when farming practice altered to mean sowing in the autumn as opposed to the spring, the results were catastrophic. There was less food in the winter and early summer breeding sites were damaged. 
In effect, the hay was cut at the wrong time. And although numbers are good on Portland, early cutting is still a threat. Of over 40 species of vetch or legume on the island, medics are amongst the earliest to appear. As grazing improves, thick clumps of both black and spotted medic add to the pasture. And the flowers of red clover become very common amongst the daisies. Growing on the rougher pastures is the tiny mouse ear. It shares these fields with bulbous buttercups, which are easily separated from meadow buttercups by the downturned sepals. The rich reds of crane's bills appear in the grass, and both hedgerow and cut-leaved crane's bill are found throughout the island. All across the island, the shartlook has rapidly grown, and its bright yellow heads are everywhere. So too is one of the earliest and most important plants on Portland, Alexander's. It's an edible plant, the flower buds are delicious in salads and the roots are said to taste like parsnips if they're boiled. But here on Portland, Alexander's perform a vital role for insects and birds. Rich in nectar, Alexander's also form temporary hedges on an island with few hedgerows, thus providing insect food, shelter and corridors for early migrants such as chiffchaffs and willow warblers. Unfortunately, councils and local landowners appear to little understand this, and many Alexanders are cut down when they're needed most, purely in the interest of tidiness. In Pencastle Woods, the sward of Alexanders is replaced by a carpet of tuberous comfrey, which spreads out beneath horse chestnuts and sycamores. In the damp soils grow lesser celandines and arums, and the shade encourages ferns. All these woodland flowers are a source of honeydew, eaten by early season butterflies, such as this speckled wood. A path through the woods leads into the remains of St Andrew's Church, and on down to Church Oak Cove. A few of the memorials in the churchyard carry the hourglass and death's head signs, to indicate man's preoccupation with the brevity of life. Life may well be short, but it should perhaps be exuberant, as the mass of nearby blackthorn blossom seems to suggest. The cliffs of chain weirs are one of the nest sites for the magnificent peregrine falcon, which in recent years has returned to Portland, where four or five pairs now regularly breed. Here they commonly feed on jackdaws and pigeons, sometimes using breathtaking vantage points to pluck their prey. They can often be seen hunting over the rocks along the shoreline, or out across the sands at Ferry Bridge, where they prey on migrant wading birds, such as dunlins and ring plovers. Peregrines are of course fully protected, but they're easily disturbed at their nest sites, so rules are issued to groups such as rock climbers and paragliding enthusiasts so that any disturbance is minimised. The importance of Alexander's cannot be overstressed, and their presence adds to the landscape that is Portland. Exotic wallflowers are found along cliffs and walls, and it's probable that there are escapes from those planted outside quarrymen's huts. And like medic, both birdsfoot trefoil and bush vetch are both early legumes. Along the east weirs, violets can be very common. The seemingly nondescript pelletry of the wall occurs everywhere there are rock faces or walls, and its tiny red and white flowers are worth a closer look. Sea beet grows all across the island, and its glossy leaves are a true sign of spring. The pale purple flowers of ivy leaf toad flax can be found all over, growing on walls and amongst the quarry and scree spoil. The tiny eye bright occurs wherever the grass is short, Common and chalk milkwort grow on the lime-rich soils. There are six species of spurge found on Portland. Perhaps surprisingly, wood spurge predominates and it's widespread. Portland spurge, with its red stalks, 
usually grows on the path edges and is often found near the sea. Church Oak Cove, with its many and varied beach charts climbing the steep cliff sides, is home to a large number of plants. This delightful flower is rue-leaved saxifrage, and close up the rue-shaped leaf is clearly evident. It and the tiny early forget-me-not shown here can confuse the naturalist with their size variation. And it's worth noting that because of the thin impoverished soils found on Portland, miniaturization often occurs. The cove and the cliffs are home to several rare plants. This tiny gem clinging to the shallow soil is a red data flower with the fantastic name of hairy fruited corn salad. In Britain, Portland proves to be one of its strongholds, although it's by no means easy to find. Common corn salad is far easier to spot. In Joyce Bee's Southwell garden, three cornered leek survives, and insects and spiders abound. Here, a crab spider lies in wait amongst the flowers and a common hunting spider, Pisora mirabilis, is most probably searching for wood lice. Shield bugs can be plentiful. The commonest are probably the green shield bug, but hawthorn shield bug and other squash bugs are also easily found. As a group, beetles have been under-recorded on Portland. The emerald green Oedemera nobilis is common, as is the bloody-nosed beetle, so named because it exudes a drop of blood from its mouth if it's alarmed. Almost two-thirds of Britain's wood lice can be found on this tiny island of limestone. The large pillwood louse, Armadillidium depressum, can be found all over Portland. but the smaller Porcello levis require the conditions found within manure or compost heaps where it can occur in good numbers. Spring temperatures quickly green up the abandoned quarries and moths and their larvae increase in variety. Infesting the brambles is the notorious brown tail moth caterpillar the hairs can cause quite severe skin irritation, so they should not be handled. Three other common larvae have emerged too. The drinker, the six-spot burnet, and the lackey all feed on the grasses, trefoils, hawthorns and blackthorns that grow here. The caterpillars of moths and butterflies are produced in huge numbers, but few mature into adulthood. Destruction of their nests, predators and parasites account for many. Here a lackey moth caterpillar falls victim to a tachinid fly. There are over 250 parasitic flies of the tachinidae and most parasitize moth or butterfly larva. They usually lay their eggs on the host's skin, the resulting maggot feeding directly on the caterpillar, which of course eventually dies. Moths in the imago or adult stage are also becoming more plentiful. A number of them are relatively common on the island and usually found in the moth traps when they can be run. The pine beauty though is a scarce visitor from inland woods, whilst this blossom underwing, Portland's first record, probably originated from the near continent. The striped hawk moth is a rare visitor from southern Europe or Africa. Adult butterflies too are visible. The small copper and the holly blue are likely freshly emerged. Red admirals at this time though may well have hibernated. As the migration period begins to pick up, the bird observatory starts to get busier. Given suitable weather conditions, the bird observatory staff and visiting ringers would ring and record about 5,000 birds during the course of the year. The majority of these will be caught in mist nets set in the observatory gardens. Birds trapped in this way can only be processed by qualified ringers, 
and the whole ringing scheme is monitored by the British Trust for Ornithology. In this instance, a gold crest is carefully extracted from a mist net. From here it's quickly taken to a ringing hut where it's weighed and measured. A uniquely numbered ring is attached to its leg before the bird is released. Any subsequent retrapping will furnish evidence of life expectancy, migration routes and range, vital to our understanding of a bird's survival requirements. Birds, of course, attract birders, who often gather at the Trinity House obelisk to scan the sea for the many different species of seabird which pass the bill. Herring gulls are always present in a few nests on the cliffs. Great black back holes too are usually recorded anywhere along the island. Of more interest than most birders, Manx shearwaters can often be seen flying within the troughs. Their bright white undersides contrast strongly with their dark upper parts. In spring and early autumn there are pronounced passages of shearwaters there's always a chance of a rarer relative, such as Balearic, Cory's or Great Shearwater. Our watchers also hope to see the common scoter, the most frequent of our sea duck. Portland's breeding orcs, many of which are returning to the cliffs of the Bill slopes, include both Razorbill and Guillemot. But sadly, there are now just one or two puffins. Man is not the only mammal of the bill. And the grey seal, on its migration through the channel, occasionally comes close to shore and can be seen in any of the many bays around the island. Also regularly visiting these waters are bottlenose dolphins. The dolphins often eat fish, such as mackerel and sprats, near to the surface. This feeding activity attracts flocks of gulls, and seasoned dolphin observers often look for gulls wheeling over the water in this way. Sometimes small groups of dolphins will remain for a while, and lucky observers can be treated to swimming displays just off the rocky shore. As dolphins migrate through our seas, birds are of course flying over it and sometimes it's possible to watch them arrive, as with these swallows heading inland after their journeys across Africa and Europe. At the same time, our resident birds, such as these meadow pipits, are bringing up their first brood of the year, taking advantage of the spring's insects. In Culverwell, this wren is building one of several half-finished nests it will construct before the final site is chosen. On the fields along the Bill Road, carrying crows stalk the grass, searching for invertebrates or mollusks. Magpies flourish on the island, bad news perhaps for the pippis chicks. Opposite Culverwell, a large manure heap has been established. It's regularly visited by good numbers of birds, including stock doves from the nearby quarries, and it's always worth checking for pipits and wagtails. The pied wagtail, the British race of the white wagtail, is regular all year. But in spring, the manure heap often hosts the continental nominate form, Alba. Compared to the pied wagtail, it's a cleaner looking bird, with white, never grey flanks. But the yellow wagtail is a summer visitor, perhaps more reliably found in fields with cattle. Occasionally the heap is graced by the beautiful blue-headed wagtail, a close relative of the yellow. It's 
a southern European bird and only an irregular visitor to the island. As the spring progresses, for many the bird observatory becomes a focal point. As they make landfall at the bill, birds are attracted to the well foliage garden set in comparatively sparse and treeless fields. Hedgerows of alexanders and other umbilifers contain hordes of insects, which are vital for hungry migrants such as this spotted flycatcher, that need to replace lost body weight before moving on to their breeding territories. In the observatory gardens, the mist nets are proving their worth, and along with important data, good views are obtained of birds such as this grasshopper warbler, this male black cat, and a stunning firecrest. This splendid male red star shows how it got its name. Start or Stuart is Old English for tail. Outside the observatory, migrants like this willow warbler use any temporary shelter they can find. In the northeast of the island lies Vern Common, and it's here that most of the evidence of earlier woodlands can still be found. During migration, the trees around the naval cemetery are always worth a good look. Here, for example, a wood warbler has stopped off on its way to an inland wood. On occasions a rare visitor occurs. The additional refrain at the end of a chiff-chaff call alerted a local bird watcher to this fine little warbler. Closer examination and the subsequent trapping of the bird revealed it to be Britain's first reliable record of Iberian chiff-chaff. Obviously not disturbed by being misnetted, the bird took up territory and remained singing for several weeks. Amongst the flowers on the vern, the deep blue of Germanda Speedwell in particular makes a good showing. In the presence of English bluebell, usually a plant of well-established woodland, alongside its gaudier Spanish cousin, again points to an earlier, more wooded period. A change in the weather at Portland usually brings a change in the birds. The first noticeable passage of swifts occurred on a particularly gloomy morning. But the mood amongst bird watchers was lifted with the finding of this female blue throat close to the observatory. The bird was blown off its course to its Scandinavian breeding grounds by a brief easterly wind and appeared on the headland purely by chance. Another example of the importance of the headland as a migration watch point comes with this carpenter bee, originally found tangled in a mist net in the observatory gardens. This rarity from southern Europe has been recorded less than ten times in Britain. A more regular migrant, the golden oriole, is recorded three or four times a year though the views rarely get as good as this. Golden Orioles do breed in Britain, but only in very small numbers. This individual probably overshot its breeding grounds in France, and on release took up temporary residence in a dense stand of elders, sallows and brambles in Culverwell. Here the bird feeds on one of its favourite foods, the caterpillars of the oak eggamoth, which is common on the island. Spring also sees the arrival of our migrant chat, the windchat. This one is a female. Windchats usually just stay a day or two before moving inland to breed on heaths and moors. Most of our stone chats, though, are resident. Their favoured nesting sites are usually quarries, but this pair on the west cliffs have chosen a somewhat less enclosed site. The island seabirds are already nesting. The former, a petrel or tube nose, is a particularly graceful flyer and has a seemingly effortlessly controlled flight. The purpose of the tube nose is still debated. The birds can vomit a foul-smelling stomach oil used for grooming and repelling predators. But whether this comes from its mouth, or both mouth and nostrils, is unclear. 
What is certain is that tubular nostrils are only found on birds that produce stomach oil. Seabirds wanting nest sites have colonised the steep cliffs within the compound of the Deera Research Centre. Herring gulls nest near the tops, these are herring gull chicks, whilst our two common orcs, the guillemot and the razorbill, compete for the precarious ledges lower down. The guillemot prefers bare ledges and they incubate their eggs standing up. The eggs are pear-shaped, designed to roll in a circle rather than sideways off the ledge if they're not. A distinct possibility given the bird's large feet and rowdy nature. A darker, chunkier razorbill prefers a more sheltered crevice. Here a pair is prospecting just such a site. Cormorants don't nest but are frequently seen. Shags can be seen at the base of our cliffs, but usually only one pair actually nests. Kittiwakes crowd in just below the cliff tops, and their plaintive calls are a familiar sound. Occasionally a first summer bird will return to the colony. But unlike these two adults performing a regurgitated food exchange, it won't breed. Ubiquitous jackdaws nest all over the island, and their calls can be heard everywhere. These small, confident members of the crow family are familiar visitors to car parks and gardens, and often fall prey to the local peregrines. Usually straightforward to identify, the odd pied bird can catch out the unwary. A pair of ravens nest on the steep cliff sides below Tout Quarry on the West Cliffs. The ravens can be seen anywhere on the island, particularly if disturbed off the cliffs by road climbers. And sometimes a family group of five or six will appear in late summer or early autumn. This scratchy song belongs to a male wheat ear. Wheat ears are common summer migrants on Portland and can return from Africa as early as February. The island would seem to have many excellent nest sites amongst its disused quarries and cliff sides, but in fact only one or two pairs stay to breed. And they favour the bill quarry next to a large public car park. They were evidently much more common ones. One man caught nearly 8,000 in 1794, when snorters, as they were known locally, sold for sixpence a dozen. Another regular migrant is the common whitethroat. This delightful Sylvia warbler can be heard singing wherever there is a suitable area of scrub and bushes often duelling with other males. In recent years, up to 66 males have held territory on the island. Chain Weir's quarry, as well as being popular with whitethroats, is also the site of Portland's one and only colony of wall lizards. Early morning often catches them drinking dew from flower heads and it's a good time to see them. These reptiles are of doubtful origin, for although various species of wall lizard inhabit southern Europe, they're not usually recorded wild in Britain. Nevertheless, they're an interesting addition to the island's fauna. On the floor of the quarry, stone crop is blossoming. And, as incongruous as the lizards, a cactus has taken root. A sign of global warming, perhaps. 
more and more flowers appear right at the end of spring. Wild clary and meadow clary can be found, but they are declining with the changes to agriculture. Red valerian is very common, be seen amongst the rocks all around the isle. The plastic looking yellow rattle is abundant, especially in the fields along the east cliffs and at Broadcroft. The colourful heads of common century appear on the short turf, and on the old calcareous soils some years produce large numbers of the beautiful bee orchid. The flower evolved its pattern to attract male bees to facilitate the transfer of pollen. Occasionally a variety known as wasp orchid can be found. Portland's first record had come two years earlier from a flower found opposite the Portland Heights Hotel. This variety occurs most often in the north of the bee orchids range and is the result of self-pollination. Shepherd's needle is a flower of cereal fields and along with once familiar species such as pheasant's eye and corn cockle used to be relatively common in the fields of Dorset and Wiltshire. The tiny white flowers appear in late spring and continue to appear well into the summer so that it's possible to find the same plant with developing seed cases or needles at the same time as producing new flowers. Regrettably modern farm practices and the use of herbicides has seen the shepherd's needle decline to such an extent that it's now rare almost everywhere and extremely rare on Portland. In recent years just one single plant of this unusual embellifer has managed to keep a foothold in one of the East Cliff fields. As things stand, the shepherd's needle may well not survive on Portland. But as spring moves imperceptibly into early summer, there is an explosion of other flowers. The grasses begin to seed with insects. A number of micro moths can be found, and the coxfoot is particularly abundant, especially around fescue grass. Clutella xylostella, the diamond bank moth, is one of our commonest immigrants. Another immigrant, the rush veneer, has occurred in the thousands. Palpita unionalis, on the other hand, is decidedly scarce. In the fields above the bird observatory stand crowds of beaked hawksbeard. These flowers attract good numbers of large whites, which are mostly immigrants, and the butterflies themselves attract a newly arrived hobby. This one is a first summer bird, which aerobatically hunts them down. Hobbies are summer migrants, and since only about a thousand breed in Britain each year, to watch one hawking insects fresh from coming in off the sea is particularly exciting. This agile flyer soon moved on up the island and disappeared inland. Another summer visitor is the now rare red-back shrike. Once a common breeding species, they no longer regularly breed in southern England. On the Bill Road, the manure heap, now framed by crucifers and thistles, continues to attract birds. Starlings are found on it all year, and much more interesting was the finding of this adult male rose-coloured starling, which joined a group of juvenile starlings one afternoon. An eruptive species, rose-coloured starlings breed from Eastern Europe across to Iran. Up to 15 occurred in Britain at the same time as this one, and on mainland Europe one even reached as far north as Finland. Unfortunately this beautiful bird stayed just two days before, like our hobby, it too disappeared inland. Portland's fast approaching the time of year when over a hundred species of flower can be seen in a day. Red and pink seems to be the colour of choice for early June, and here a common vetch. Hedge woundwort, this one with cuckoo spit, which is the nymphal case of a frog hopper, and ubiquitous herb robert, a common species of cranesbill. Exotic and brilliantly coloured, gladiolus is probably not a truly wild flower in our region, but it has established itself in the fields adjoining the bill where it's common. Whatever its botanic merits, it makes a convenient perch for this meadow pipit.
Along the Bill Road, common mallow crowns the verges, and the familiar field poppy grows on any disturbed soil. The beautiful pyramidal orchid grows on the bill slopes and around quarry edges. Occasionally a white form of this orchid occurs. A large number of snails take advantage of the emergence of so many plants. While some are tiny, uncommon or confined to wet areas, two or three are more widespread. Both black-lipped and white-lipped snails are common. The pink Kentish snail is common along the Bill Road. An occasional rare land snail, such as this girdled snail, Agromia cinctella, has been found by visiting conchologist John Fleming. A species familiar to most Portland gardeners, the large garden snail is widespread. But the pointed snail is more maritime and found mainly on the bill. Off the end of the bill, the nesting walks are busy fetching food for their young. Razorbills and guillemots sometimes have to travel far out to sea to find fish shoals. Meanwhile in the Bill Quarry, our wheat ears have managed to raise young, and the newly fledged juveniles sit amongst the rocks. These birds are closely related to thrushes, and their juveniles are likewise heavily spotted. But even at this age, wheat ears show the white rear that give the birds their name. The young birds chase the adults for food relentlessly, not always successfully. Also feeding voraciously are these young linnets. They're amongst just a few species to be fed mainly on seeds at such a young age. The pink flowers of thrift are common along the coast and down at Ferry Bridge it carpets the thin soils being established on the shingle. A few hundred metres away, a tall fence marks the area of a nationally important little tern colony, and their calls are commonly heard as they fish in the shallows. Little terns are an endangered breeding species in Britain, and remain very vulnerable to damage, caused by people treading on the well-camouflaged eggs which lie in the open on bare stones. Whilst the adult turns feed and wash, the eggs are vulnerable to marauding gulls. And by night, hedgehogs and foxes hunt the beaches as well. Nevertheless, there is some hope for the future. The fleet reserve usually holds in excess of 80 nests, and the colony is looked after by both full-time and part-time wardens. However, there's no way to prevent a peregrine attacking the colony. On this occasion, a dunlin or a ringed plover was taken, but with the survival so delicately balanced, all steps must be taken to ensure some successful breeding. Portland holds an estimated population of between 180 and 200 foxes. Some are poisoned illegally, some become road victims, and some years many die of disease, which is more often or not the mange. Despite these losses, numbers remain high, when not hunting terns, they're often seen in residential gardens or quarries. Along the east weirs, summer flower species are burgeoning, and this honeysuckle has attracted a ringlet with its fragrance. The abandoned Victorian prison baths lie between the sea and the disused railway line here, and although rare on Portland, 
common Gromwell grows along their edges. Fresh water collected in the baths attract a variety of wildlife. Here it accommodates stands of common water crowfoot. Any disturbed soil along the weirs is colonised by banks of weld, thistles, vipers, bugloss and docks. Also growing here is self-heal. Despite its name, there's little evidence that it was ever used as a curative. Extremely common on the weirs is red valerian, which grows on the thinnest soils. And here and there, bright patches of vetch carpet the stony ledges. As June days lengthen, more plants appear. Here the spikes of teasel rise above the grasses. Everywhere stands of hogweed replace Alexander's as the dominant umbellifa. Hogweed can grow to two metres, and as with Alexander's, provides shelter and food for birds on an island with few hedges. Here a whitethroat hunts insects within this temporary cover. The tall great mullein is a flower of calcareous soils. Here the distinctive caterpillars of the mullein moth devour the plant, their bright colours warning off potential predators. The remarkable twig-like caterpillars of the swallowtail moth, however, rely on camouflage for survival. Swallowtail moths prefer the edges of woods or large gardens, where their eggs are laid on the underside of the leaves of ivy, hawthorn or privet. Eventually the caterpillars hibernate to reappear the following June to pupate beneath the leaves of the food plant. At this time of year, a number of moths that fly during the day can often be encountered. They can easily be flushed from grasses or shrubs on warm summer days. The majority of moths, though, of course, are nocturnal, and by night a huge variety of them are attracted to the lights set in the observatory grounds. Over 1,000 different moth species have been recorded on Portland, and every year additions to the list are noted. Such a rich Lepidoptera makes the island a mecca for visiting enthusiasts. And as the pictures show, far from being dull insects, moths are often large, quite brilliantly coloured, or surprisingly well disguised. Take, for example, the Chinese character, which at first glance has the appearance of a bird dropping. Another very interesting moth is here perfectly camouflaged on a lichen-covered gatepost. Almost perfect camouflage is the peppered moth's best defence against predators such as the little owl. Whilst the peppered moths on Portland are quite speckled, others differ in coloration depending on their surroundings and their predominant habitat colours. Little owls have successfully colonised the old quarries, and at dusk their sharp mewing cue calls can be heard in any of these old workings. They too are well camouflaged for life on the ledges of their chosen environments. Little owls take a wide variety of prey, but they will also predate on slow worms. On Portland, slow worms emerge in mid-March. They're not snakes, but are actually legless lizards, which need to bask in the sun to raise their body temperatures. Old quarry sites might be good for slow worms, other lizards and even adders, but they're also good for flowers. And the wild carrot, an umbellifer, often grows in profusion. 
and wherever it is found there's a chance of finding the strange parasitic carrot broom rape. These broom rapes don't possess their own green pigment and so attach themselves to the root systems of host plants. Common yarrow looks like an umbellifer but it is in fact a delicate member of the daisy or compositi family of plants. In the northeast of the island the same habitats and poor quality soils near Nicodemus's knob produce a different variety of flowers. Requiring thin, impoverished soils, the white stone crop grows here. But the ground ivy and the figwort grow on the deeper soils around the cable stores. The northeast of the island seems particularly suitable for yellow hammers. These beautiful birds breed amongst the brambles and elderberries in this corner of Portland. Once far more numerous, the yellowhammer, like the skylark, fell victim to changing farming practices and numbers have dwindled. No doubt spring sowing and winter stubble would tempt this colourful bunting back onto the field systems nearer the bill tip. This part of the island is well known for its vetches, for the butterflies they attract to the Broadcroft Reserve. All of these trefoils, vetches and vetchlings, some of which are very scarce like the Bithynian vetch, are the favoured food plants of blue butterflies in particular, but perhaps the most important flower of all is bird's foot trefoil, for it's the host plant to many insects that takes pride of place as a food plant of the threatened silver studded blue. Here the caterpillar of the Cretaceous race of this rare butterfly crawls over a stone. The egg will have overwintered, and the caterpillar will now feed on the flowers and leaves of bird's foot trefoil, crown vetch and rock rose. The adult is flying by the end of June and is on the wing until early August, and the caterpillar is always in close association with black ants. For identification, look for the silver studs here on the underside of the hind wing in the bottom left of the picture. As well as the endemic silver studded blue, the East Weirs are a stronghold for other blue butterflies. The common blue is numerous here. The caterpillar is frequently visited by ants, which feed on secretions produced by glands at the hind end, and in turn they protect it from predators. The small blue is less common not actually blue but is in effect a dark brown powdered with blue. Whilst the butterfly feeds on nectar, the caterpillar, which will eventually hibernate in a withered flower, feeds on kidney vetch. Sometimes the blue of the Adonis blue can be quite dazzling in bright sunshine as the insects fly between the yellow kidney vetches. The hibernating caterpillar can be found on the shriveled heads of the host plant. The East Cliffs and Weirs have in recent years become the site for a colony of Lulworth skippers. These butterflies breed elsewhere on the Purbex and have recently colonised another site on Portland towards the Bill. In Britain this butterfly is confined to the Dorset coast. The East Weirs stretch from beyond Rufus Castle and Church Oak Cove and are an area of cliff and quarry scree covered in bramble, elderberry, cotoneaster and wayfarer. The grasses contain many of the 40 plus vetches and legumes found on Portland that are so attractive to insect life. Another of the butterflies which thrives in this corner of Portland is the marbled white. This is in fact a member of the browns or satyridae butterflies. Here it feeds on the abundant gnatweeds, thistles and other compositi. Also found is the tiny moth-like grizzled skipper. And large skippers fly from late May until early September and their caterpillars feed on the common tall grass. 
Occasionally the delicate clouded yellow butterfly migrates as far as Britain. Portland is a good place to find one. These thin calcareous soils support a number of interesting plants such as ribbed melilot and common arum, also known as lords and ladies. Flourishing in bare grassy places is the wild parsnip. These slopes above Underhill are also good for butterflies and flowers. Here, agrimony is one of the many plants attractive to insects. Elsewhere on Portland, some old quarry areas are being infilled with spoil and unwanted soils from off the island. Such a site is Suck Thumb Quarry, where it's possible to discover plants which had previously been rare or unrecorded until this dumping began. Many of the introduced soils are not calcareous in origin, and therefore shouldn't really form any part of the reclamation processes. Teasels will grow on any waste ground. Birds often search out drowned insects found in water collected at the leaf nodes. This water was also once thought to cure warts or sore eyes. And wherever there is waste ground and poor soils, spear thistles will grow. Sometimes along with slender thistles, they grow in large numbers. The seed heads provide food for small birds, such as buntings, finches and linnets. Here a juvenile goldfinch strips out seeds with its long, sharply pointed bill, which is ideally suited to seeking seeds from such plants. The almost translucent burnet rose prefers calcareous soils as opposed to infill material. But by July, brambles are flowering on any wasteland. Here, Britain's largest hoverfly, Volucello zonaria, is attracted to the brambles' pink and white petals. Stinking irises are so named because of the smell of their crushed parts. Here, a speckled wood butterfly feeds. The many stalks of wood sage are very attractive to insects, especially to bees and bumblebees. And at this time of the year, along most cliff paths, rock samphire can be found. Down at the Fleet Nature Reserve and Ferry Bridge, shoreline and shingle plants are appearing, along with commoner species like the pink flowered rest harrow and rocket. Sea kale prefers the shingle or the sand dunes, and the strange rare sea holly produces its spiky leaves and flowers near the duck boards that crisscross the dunes. Slowly the vegetation is taking over the shingle beach. The thin soils here support flowers such as greater sea spurry, and down on the mud flat edges the strange glasswort appears. The bare stalks of buckthorn plantain poke through clumps of sea clover. They are established on the thin soils along with the delicate hare's foot clover. The striking sea bindweed grows on both sand and shingle, and the beautiful yellow horned poppy flourishes on the fleet side of Chesil Beach. Plant life here is rich, and flower recognition walks are arranged during the year, particularly in June and July and many people come to the Fleet Reserve to enjoy the wide range of shoreline plants on display. It's midsummer at the Bill, and this beautiful South African Hottentop fig frames this view of the Trinity House light. The coastline here is an ideal habitat for Portland's resident rock pipits. Slightly larger and greyer than meadow pipits, they breed in moderate numbers all around the island, and their numbers are augmented in spring and autumn by additional migrants. The coastline is also excellent for marine life, and the seas off Portland and along the Purbeck coast are for a large part marine nature reserves. Much of the animal life protected here are mollusks, 
which cling to the rocks and fill the rock pools. Portland has two main species of periwinkle, and shown here are the rough periwinkle, or Litterina saxitalis, and the small blue periwinkle, or Litterina neratoides. There are three species of limpet commonly seen in and around the rock pools. Here's a common limpet, Patella vulgata, Patella aspera, and a black-footed limpet, Patella depressa. As its name suggests, the common mussel, Mytilus edulis, is quite widespread. There are two commonly encountered barnacle species, and these are Cathamelus stellatus, which is rounded or oval in shape, and Cathamelus montagua, which is kite-shaped. Stellatus is the oceanic barnacle, which is found here on the rocks in large numbers. The dark blue marine springtail is everywhere amongst the rocks and pools. These same cliffs now bear carpets of golden sunfire, which act like magnets to migrant painted ladies. Small groups of these butterflies regularly migrate northwards from their strongholds in southern Europe. In the bill quarry, the juvenile wheat ears, now looking much more like the adults, can be seen feeding amongst the rocks, along with rabbits and small flocks of linnets. Here the linnets are taking the seeds of south thistles, and though their name derives from the Latin linum, which refers to the flax family, linnets today survive on a more mixed diet of both wildflower and arable plant seeds. A midsummer night with a full moon rising behind the observatory heralds a suitable evening to catch storm petrels. Using a tape lure, petrels, which can sometimes be seen pattering above the waves during the day, are best trapped at night from the rocks at the bill. As with other migrants, the birds are mist-netted, weighed, measured and ringed. Storm petrels hatched around the British Isles move to the South Atlantic or to the Indian Ocean before returning north to wander around our coasts for three to four years. And some birds trapped on Portland have been recovered as far away as Shetland and Norway or as near as St Albans Head in the Purbeck Hills. The gardens and fields at the observatory are good sites for another summer speciality, the glowworm. Males are winged, and it's they which fly around seeking the light being emitted by the wingless females, which sit in the undergrowth on warm summer evenings. The glow of the glowworm is produced by a chemical reaction, where a luminescent substance, such as luciferin, is activated by a catalyst, such as luciferi. The glow consumes very little energy, produces no heat, and is composed almost entirely of light. Summer at the observatory also means dragonflies and damselflies around the purpose-built ponds. One of the largest areas of fresh water on the island, the ponds are extremely important to many forms of wildlife. The dragon and damselflies are attracted to the water to lay their eggs on logs or submerged vegetation. Our three blue damselflies are difficult to separate from several other species, and the field guide to the dragonflies and damselflies of Great Britain is recommended reading. The azure damselfly often appears bright, while the blue-tailed damselfly comes in a variety of colour forms and some show wide variation. The common blue damselfly is also difficult to identify, but on the wing it appears as a more powerful flyer than the azure. Our recent records of the large red damselfly is probably the result of eggs being imported to the ponds on aquatic plants. Sympetrum strilatum, or the common data, is a great migrant and breeds regularly on Portland. In their searches for ovipositing females, male migrant hawkers will fly very low along the edges of sluggish or still fresh water. Whilst the females are dull yellow, green and brown, the males are predominantly blue and black. Emperors are the most agile of British dragonflies. 
Their flight season is a long one from early June into late August, and although they are found all across southern Britain, they do need well-vegetated ponds. Here a female is using her ovipositor to lay eggs on submerged weed. Also visiting the pond are broad-bodied chasers. Aggressive and very active, they tend to be most successful on ponds with the least bankside vegetation and often shun densely vegetated pools. The species does well here, as evidenced by this freshly emerged individual still sat by the nymphal case. And here also is the tenoral stage of common data, when it's just emerged from the pupa state and is still soft and lacks the adult's colours. This immature migrant hawker will probably spend several days at the pond site. And this juvenile black-tailed skimmer belongs to a species which is quite common in southern Britain and appears to be expanding its range. Now that spring migration is long over, there are less bird watchers at the observatory and a calm descends. There's still much of interest though for both professional and amateurs alike, and as if to prove the point, a late round of the miss nets one July afternoon produces a most unexpected arrival, an olivaceous warbler. Entirely grey and white, with no yellow in the plumage at all, the in-hand measurements finally prove that the bird was the eastern race Eliaca. Quite a stir was caused in the ornithological world, it being a possible first record for Britain and a definite first for Dorset. Old Portland records of olivaceous warblers are now considered to conform to Melodious Warbler, the most regular Hippolaeus on the island. In some years up to ten are recorded between midsummer and early autumn. In the autumn adult birds are heavily worn and it's the younger birds in summer which have brighter yellower plumages. At this time of the year much of interest revolves around flowers and the insects they attract. In the garden there are many plants grown deliberately to attract bumblebees, honeybees, wasps, butterflies and moths. Until the establishment of the bird observatory in 1961 the area now occupied by the garden was close cropped turf stretching down to the cliff edge. Some 40 years of growth using the stone walls as shelter for young trees has resulted in nearly two acres of mixed vegetation. And from the air this green patch must look very appealing to migrant insects and birds. A family much attracted to these flowers are the hoverflies. Worldwide there are about 5,000 species. The beautiful Chrysotoxum elegans is uncommon on mainland Dorset, but found in numbers on Portland. Helophilus pendulus is sometimes known as the sunshine hoverfly. And Helophilus trivitatus is the largest of the Helophilus species and the most handsome. This tiny insect is a male Cerita pipiens, a very common, very aggressive species. Looking remarkably like male worker bees, these drone flies are common almost everywhere. These, a male and a female, will leave their larva, the rat-tailed maggot, to develop in stagnant water. One of our commonest species is Episurphus baltiatus, or the marmalade hoverfly. Sometimes their numbers can be added to when tens of thousands get blown over from continental Europe. It's a true gardener's friend, for its larvae feed exclusively on aphids. Portland is also justly famous for its migrant and vagrant summer moths. The striking Jersey tiger is a regular visitor. The intricately patterned Arash moth, looking under the lens like a living piece of Arabian carpet, is now very rare in Britain. And this Egyptian bollworm was a first record for Dorset, and only the third ever recorded in the UK.
Other moths occurring at this time include the Portland Ribbon Wave, which in Britain now only breeds on this small limestone island. Its larva have never been found in the wild. Portland's an excellent place too to find some noteworthy micro-moths. Eudonia mercurella, form Portlandica, can be found here. Its larva feeds on mosses, on walls, trees or rocks. Whilst so that of the sea lavender plume moth feeds on any of the three species of sea lavender which grow here. Along the cliff tops, golden samphire supports a Pishnia banksiella, a moth discovered new to science on Portland in 1887, named in honour of the Lepidopterus de Eustace Banks. Occasionally, the deep disused quarries, such as Yolans, contain surprises. In 1998, a small colony of fleabane moths, Debenomicalis, were discovered on fleabane here and in Culverwell. At the time, this immigrant was new to Dorset, but has scarcely been seen since that event. Another moth, Cynida dentalis, is found on the brilliant blue Vipers bugloss, and this flower also supports the tiny Tinagma ochnerostomella, a moth restricted to British coasts from Devon to Lincolnshire. The common plant white clover sustains a micromoth on Cochera semi-rubella, which also uses bird's foot trefoil as a host plant. Growing everywhere is wild carrot, and it acts as the food plant for another micro, Citicroa palialis. This moth is uncommon but appears to be expanding its range. Wild carrot is also attractive to soldier beetles, which are very common on the island. Here they share the flower head with well-marked signal flies. Plants and insects abound at this time of the year. Chorizus hyacyami feeds on a variety of coastal plants, and the beautifully marked and aptly named wasp beetle favours dense vegetation. The bright 22-spot ladybird is quite common on Portland, sometimes turns up in moth traps, whilst a brilliant green rose chafer is a member of the family of beetles known as Scarabaeidae. Underhill Village lies in a cleft in the slopes and faces west across Lime Bay towards the Devon coast. On the grassy slopes above the village, wild privet thrives, as does the yellowwort, one of the commonest members of the gentian family. The fine pastel blues of pale flax are also found here and there are many mallows brightening up the scene. This one is probably a garden escape. At the other end of the island, the moister soils in and around Culverwell support large numbers of fleabane and willow herb. Along the path margins, Lucerne, yet another of Portland's 40-plus legumes, can be found. Three species of knapweed occur on Portland, and they are perhaps the single most important plants for a whole variety of insects. Here the small skipper, identified by the orange tips to the underside of the antennae, feeds on the nectar of common knapweed. Over the same flowers along the west cliffs, there's usually a pair of kestrels holding territory. Notice how the bird keeps its head perfectly still whilst hovering. Kestrel is a scarce breeder on Portland. Annually, just one or two pairs nest. All three knapweeds, black, common and greater, occur at this time, and are all are worth examining for the myriad of insects they attract. They belong to the daisy family, which includes their close relatives, the thistles. Of course, many other species of flowers also grow along the cliffs and along the grassy quarry edges in July and August. A number of coastal specialities and fairly common on Portland. Amongst the more widespread species are hoary oxford and common ragworts. 
Here, common ragwort, which if eaten by horses and cattle can prove fatal, acts as host plant to cinnabar moth caterpillars. Both the adult moth and the larva are excellent examples of warningly coloured insects. They're decidedly unpleasant to taste, and birds, for example, soon learn to leave them alone. A few tiny early field systems remain in the northeast of the island, and these fields repay further investigation. Here, for example, are large numbers of small heath butterflies, and both five and six spot burnet moths thrive in this area. These handsome day-flying moths are on the wing from June to August. The larvae hatch from eggs laid in batches and feed on vetches or clovers. They construct their cocoons high up on the fragile grass stems to avoid predation by birds. Another insect heavily depends on gnatweeds is the dusky sallow moth. And yet another day-flying moth, the four-spotted, here feeding on a thistlehead, has its stronghold on Portland. This northeast corner contains Nicodemus's knob. The height of this limestone column gives us some idea of just how much of the capping limestone was removed by quarrying. Here it acts as a fine backdrop for a standard broad-leaved everlasting pea. This area also supports common toad flax, and the close-cropped turf of the crisscrossing pathways is home to autumn gentians. Returning to Joyce Bee's garden, we can see how important such habitats are to birds, flowers and insects. Soils here support the beautiful but declining orange hawkweed or fox and cubs, and elsewhere the equally rare lesser snapdragon or weasel snout. Other flowers in the garden hide such predators as the spider Misumina vatia, or white death. The females are actually changeable, sometimes appearing green or yellow. A surface type hoverfly larva devours aphids and in the process assists the gardener. The end of July and early August finds a peak in the numbers of grasshoppers. These insects differ from crickets in possessing short, thickish antennae instead of long, thread-like ones. All grasshoppers sing or stridulate by rubbing their hind legs against thickened, falling veins. A new range of butterflies have appeared too. The chalk hill blue has emerged from a larva which pupated in a hole in the ground. Soon eggs will be laid on horseshoe vetch to hatch during the next April. In fields all over the island are found meadow brown butterflies. The meadow brown is a reluctant flyer, preferring to linger in its grassland habitat. Tout Quarry is a rich site for red admirals, which congregate on the many buddleia bushes which have colonised the old workings. There are also important colonies here of wall brown and grayling butterflies. The eye on the underside of a grayling's wing diverts the attention of any would-be predator away from its body. The wall brown has two broods, May and June and July and August, and consequently is seen throughout most of the summer. Often seen in the quarries, Pyrosta aurata, or the purple and gold moth, has a liking for rough, grassy places, and is especially drawn to areas carpeted with red bartsia. Other moths, such as the barred rivulet, also find this heathery purple plant attractive. Another flower which grows on limestone and chalk is the scabious. On Portland, both the field scabious and the small scabious are found.
Old disused quarry sites are equally good for the elusive Addo or Viper. This large female was found under an old discarded sheet of corrugated iron. Britain's only poisonous snake can be found in sun traps on any of the remoter sites throughout the island, but it has doubtless declined through persecution. Another group of insects reaching their peaks in midsummer, the bush crickets, which are well represented on Portland. Male bush crickets sing by rubbing a tooth rib in the left forewing against the rear edge of the right forewing. These insects differ from true grasshoppers in having long, thin antennae, and differ from crickets by having their feet divided into four segments instead of three. Bush crickets lay single eggs, either in the ground or on plants. Hatching occurs during the next spring, and the worm-like larvae molt continuously, becoming more and more like the adult bush crickets at each stage. Both the adult and nymphal stages eat other insects as well as plant material. Portland, the bush cricket most likely to be encountered is the great green, which spends its time in nettle beds and bramble patches. Its almost continuous penetrating song is heard all over the island on warm summer evenings. A real Portland special, the scaly cricket is a Mediterranean species which until recently was thought to occur in the UK only on Chesil Beach. These crickets are found beneath rocks and rubble along the sheltered foreshore of the Fleet Lagoon. Despite newly discovered colonies elsewhere in Britain, it's extremely rare. Late summer sees the first migrant shorebirds returning south. These turnstones, still in their summer orange and black plumage, will soon begin to molt into the duller colours of winter dress. The classic turnstone action when seeking food is well in evidence here. The tidal mudflats of Ferrybridge are rich in lugworms and mollusks and attract migrant waders, which aren't the only creatures seeking these invertebrates. Here a family of bait diggers compete with the birds. Returning from their North British or Arctic Circle breeding grounds, shorebirds present taxing problems for the birdwatcher. Perhaps the typical wader is the dunlin. Some still carry signs of their black bellies from their breeding plumages as they feed up on their journey south. Occupying much the same feeding niche as the Dunlin is this sandling, which occurs in smaller numbers here. The Dunlins and sandlings are joined by two fine immature curlew sandpipers, whose longer bills enable them to probe for mollusks at a deeper level in the mud. Walking along the tidal edge, this bar-tailed godwit causes its prey to become active by its habit of walking forward and moving the lower mandible of its bill to cause vibrations. Causing vibrations is the reason for this foot trembling being employed by this juvenile ringed plover. The incidence of foot trembling increases when small crustaceans are less active. Such inactivity is common, for example, when the temperatures are low. Elsewhere, this little stint seeks food from small cliff-top rock pools on the east cliffs near Portland Bill. Other birds are on the move too, and these sandwich terns, possibly from their breeding site on Brownsey Island to the east, are on their way to the wintering grounds along the coast of the Mediterranean and Africa. The checkerboard juveniles accompany the adults.
Elsewhere on the island, pipits and linnets are beginning to gather on the fence-wise in preparation for their migrations. It's always worth checking through the pipit flocks for rarer visitors. One such search revealed this juvenile tawny pipit. The tawny pipit breeds in mainland Europe and is a rare but regular late summer or early autumn visitor when winds blow from the east or southeast. A beautiful turtle dove is found amongst the resident collar doves. Formerly a common bird, the turtle dove has seen its numbers severely reduced by changes to farming and by the continued carnage wrought by hunters in France and Italy in particular. Here the attraction for both species is a prospect of easy meals from the chicken pens. And at the very end of summer, an Ortolan bunting entering its first winter takes advantage of the same food source. Ortolans are night flying migrants, and this one is on its way south from its Scandinavian breeding grounds. Summer moves seamlessly on into autumn, and subtle changes occur. Blackberries ripen and insects prepare for shorter, cooler days. A fox moth caterpillar feeds on the clifftop brambles prior to overwintering as a full-grown larva. Small larva of brown tail moths weave their nests tight against the thorns. Slows ripen and the traveller's joy blossoms continue to attract late butterflies such as this red admiral. A host of other insects as well as red admirals are also attracted to ivy. Ivy blossom becomes an important source of nectar and here attracts both admirals and the hoverfly Volucella zinaria. Fewer flowers mean less competition for space. Here field bindweed covers the bank and tansy appears by the path side. Almost unnoticed in the observatory quarry or around the red triangle cricket ground grows the last of the year's orchids, the autumn's ladies' tresses. Autumn is a traditional time for fungi, but in truth they can be found all year. On Portland, four species of puffball have been identified. They can be found on the Bill Common and in the Hutt Fields. In recent years, more and more species of fungi have been recorded. A large number of these are associated with dung and animal droppings. And during the past few years, the numbers of livestock, particularly horses, have grown, and this fact alone probably accounts for many new records. Storms are frequent in the autumn, and strong west or southwest winds will often produce excellent sea watching in Chisel Cove, with a number of species often close to the shore. Here, an Arctic tern struggles along the tide line on the second or third day of continuous winds. Both adult gannets and the variably plumaged immatures often move closer to the shore following shoals of fish. Sometimes up to 500 gannets will be in these offshore fishing flocks. Often seen in European waters, especially during these early autumn storms, are sooty shearwaters. And any strong onshore winds can be good for seabirds off the bill. Unusually, this great skewer has landed on the pulpit rock prior to harassing other seabirds. Whilst its more agile cousin, an arctic skewer, speeds through the troughs on a similar mission.
on land, wrens still hold territory wherever there is suitable cover. And the song thrush, now sadly in decline all over Britain, puts in an appearance. Autumn migration begins in earnest, bringing this juvenile red-backed shrike. Sadly, breeding in Britain seems to have ceased, and this young bird's arrival is probably the result of being blown off course from its Scandinavian breeding grounds. Much rarer on Portland, but a regular if scarce winter visitor elsewhere in Britain, this fine great grey shrike appeared near Tout Quarry. All of the fields near the observatory are now almost bereft of flowers, and the emphasis switches back to looking for migrant birds. This brief view of a passing marsh harrier is typical of the glimpses bird watchers obtain when the birds cross our narrow neck of land and move straight out into the channel. Every year one or two merlins winter on Portland. Here one pauses on a fence post, close to where wheat ears gather before their journeys to Africa. Our three or four pairs of resident stone chats are joined by passage migrants in both spring and autumn. Now annual in Britain in small numbers, the long distance migrant race Mora, the Siberian stone chat, is occasionally found on Portland. It's a much paler bird, and one of its distinctive features is an unspotted rusty buff rump. Another off-course migrant, a Rhinek, pays a brief visit to the hut fields. It's well known that escaped birds often follow migrants, ending up on peninsulas or offshore islands. And here a red-headed quelia joins the observatory's resident house sparrows for a week or two. Overhead, the wires on the headland are becoming heavy with swallows and martins preparing for their long and hazardous flights to Africa. Many of them are in immature plumages. These swallows may well have arrived from inland Dorset farms and could well have roosted in large numbers in the reed beds at Radapole and Lodmore before flying out to Portland. Almost all British swallows winter in eastern and southern parts of South Africa. House martins are tape lured to the Heligoland trap or to the mist nets beside the pool where they feast on newly emerged flying ants. One of the island's local rock pipits also visits the poolside, tempted by such easy pickings and a late common data suns itself on rocks at the pond edge. At this time of the year, our robins, such as this one, are often joined by migratory members of its own species. The nocturnal migrants, and numbers are often greatly raised in autumn. Between 50 and 100 pied flycatchers are regularly recorded between early August and the end of September. And it's often easier to see common red starts on Portland during migration than in their woodland breeding sites, where they can prove to be quite elusive. East or southeast winds have probably caused this barred warbler to appear in the well-fruited garden of the bird observatory. This bird remained for nearly a month and made short work of stripping both elderberry and bramble bushes of their fruit.
this long-tailed rose finch caused quite a stir when it arrived. It has not been accepted as a full vagrant for some are kept in captivity, but its arrival date, undamaged condition and shyness all pointed to its being a possible wild bird. As a genuine migrant, long-tailed rose finches are plentiful in both Russia and China. At this time of the year, the mist nets are very productive, and this male ringoozle has freshly arrived from its breeding grounds in upland Britain. Another wryneck has appeared in the garden. Formerly much more common in Britain, they now appear as scarce but regular spring and autumn migrants. Here the bird performs its neck-twisting movements, from which it's been so accurately named. plumage so matches the trunk of a tree that little wonder these birds are so difficult to spot. This young sparrowhawk is yet to learn how to hunt and at the same time avoid a mist net. The easterly winds also produce another minor rarity, this red-breasted flycatcher. The bird is identified as an immature by the tipping to the covert feathers and the buff wash to the throat and breast. Not so many weeks ago, this chiff chaff moving through the tamarisk might well have been moving north rather than south on its return journey. There's a small resident breeding population of blue tits. They nest at suitable quarry and garden sites throughout the island and frequent the gardens during the year. A wide variety of spiders exist on Portland. They are carnivorous predatory arthropods the spiders usually eat insects, but some will eat other arthropods, including different species of spider. All spiders have jointed legs and external skeletons made of chitin, hardened like armour. As spiders grow, they can shed their exoskeletons. Generally speaking, there are three types of spiders. There are those which hunt down their prey, those which lie in wait and pounce on their prey, and those which build traps or webs to ensnare their food victims. All types are found on the island. Portland's most spectacular spider though is Agiope Brunici, or the wasp spider. This spider is spreading along England's south coast and is well established in fields and gardens on the island. The male is insignificantly small and waits in the female's web. After mating, he is sometimes killed by the much larger female. Agiope Brunici builds a low web in the vegetation to trap jumping insects such as grasshoppers and crickets. Another feature of autumn is the appearance of the hornet, Europe's largest social wasp and largest stinging insect. It delights in drinking sap and in sucking juices from fruit such as from this blackberry. Also at large at this time is the door beetle, which breeds in dung, which it drags back into burrows constructed beneath cowpats. The caterpillars of three moths, the grey dagger, straw bell, and the autumn generation of oak egger, all display their differing defence mechanisms. The dagger and egger larvae rely on colour warnings, whilst the straw bell, somewhat like the swallowtail, depend on their twig-like appearances. All three moths cease flying in autumn. There are, of course, plenty of moth species in autumn. Unlike the spring species, those in autumn are on the whole less brightly coloured and more match autumn's browns and yellows. They're often very well camouflaged and some of the resident moths are hard to find away from limestone grassland areas such as Portland. Large numbers of migrants can turn up, 
particularly if the winds turn suddenly, a number of them being eruptive species from southern Europe and North Africa. One of the most distinctive, certainly one of the largest, is the convolvulus hawk moth, whose larvae are occasionally found on bindweed on the island. Far smaller, the hummingbird hawk moth is one of the outstanding insect migrants. From its southern European stronghold, it will fly as far north as the Arctic and into high mountains to the edge of vegetation. Its migratory prowess has even led to its recent colonisation of parts of North America. These amazing moths are diurnal and can often be seen extracting nectar from flowers such as red valerian. Each year their hovering flight leads to them being reported as birds. Another distance migrant is the painted lady and here again Red Valerian acts as the magnet. But perhaps the most famous traveller of all is the monarch. Only DNA testing will prove whether this monarch originated from populations in the Canaries or from North America, where it regularly migrates vast distances between its breeding grounds in Canada and its Mexican wintering quarters. Studies and observations of the migration of birds, animals and insects are of much interest in the autumn. In the few existing hedges and small wooded areas, such as around Southwell School, North Woods and the trees below Pennsylvania Castle, become important for providing shelter and food for migrants of all sorts. Even this brown long-eared bat could well have been a partial migrant, attracted to the insects sheltering in and around the trees. However, it's the birds which dominate the time of most migration watches. Amongst the arrivals will inevitably be the delightfully agile Goldcrest, and its rare and near relative, the beautiful Firecrest, which occasionally overwinters in the observatory gardens. These birds often move through the trees in small flocks with chiffchaffs and other philosopher's warblers which are also moving south and sometimes over winter. These flocks can sometimes reveal the hyperactive yellow-browed warbler blown off its migratory course from the Siberian taiga to southern Asia. Rarely, but almost annually, yet another Siberian gem occurs, most usually in the Pennsylvania Castle Woods. The Palaces warbler normally winters in Southeast Asia, having nested anywhere from southern Siberia to Manchuria. Its ability to hover, its crown stripe and yellow rump are all features of this excellent bird. Autumn moves on and some woodland fungi appear on the damp wooden boards forming the steps down through Penn Woods to St Andrew's Church above Church Oak Cove. Nineteen ninety nine was a prolific year for fungi on Portland. Records for this year exceeded fifty species, and many of these were found on the largest open space in the south of the island, the Bill Common. The common and the fields down to the bill tip contain both meadow and woodland fungi species. Wood and field bluets grow on the bill common, along with a variety of mushrooms such as the red staining mushroom. 
this colourful sulphur tuft was found amongst the huts. An interesting observation, these tiny mites were discovered grazing on mushrooms on the common. They're probably cryptostigmatid mites, which are saprophagic, meaning that they feed on decaying organic matter and fungi. This is, given the right weather conditions, a time for wax caps. The somewhat muted colours of the yellow and green parrot wax cap contrast with the brightness of orange red wax cap. Other species include the meadow wax cap and the brilliant scarlet hood. Portland's late autumnal sunrises can prove very beautiful and dramatic. Migratory birds continue to arrive. Species such as this beautiful brambling migrating to spend the winter in Britain. As is this field fair, returning from its Scandinavian breeding grounds to winter in stubble fields across the central and southern UK. Occasionally winds from the east bring Lapland buntings to Portland. These birds usually winter in small numbers along Britain's east coast. This one remained faithful to a weedy track for over a week. Fortunately for bird watchers, Lapland buntings often call during flight, and once the similar call of snow bunting has been eliminated, flight identification becomes possible. In autumn, Brad's warblers should be moving from their Siberian breeding grounds down through East Asia and on into places such as Thailand. This rare, large Velocopus warbler had been recorded just twice on Portland before two occurrences within three days. Good views are usually difficult to obtain, as the species habitually skulks in thick undergrowth. Autumn ends with a real red letter event. Checking pipit flocks reveals not one, but two Blythe's pipits. These very rare visitors were originally misidentified in the field as a pair of oddly marked Richard's pipits. An exciting trapping session ends with groundbreaking identification details of an elusive species which breeds in southern Siberia and Tibet. Right, here's the median cover, it's a spot on John, it's like that, isn't it? It is possible, yes. That streaks on that crown. Mm. Four, five. Spot. Where is it? It's hard, isn't it? So it's probably there. So, yeah. and look at the behind the eye. There's no black behind mm. the eye. Okay. Right. Well, there yeah. we see a sort of a new tertial. Mm -hmm. Top tertials new. Medium coverts here are just oh. old. What's possibly that? that's a new possibly one. Possibly that's mm. that. It looks like a new one. That's it's a new so one. look, you see that isn't a, it isn't a hidden one, so you'd expect it to be worn. I think, well, I think it's, it's a bit glossier as well. But and again, it's the same sort of Martin, thing. Martin, there's isn't an it? inner one. New. Yeah. See? Yeah. Absolutely classic blies. Again. I'm well, not sure. You meant to look at the middle ones. I think it's got to be inner greater coverts to be sure of the, the pattern. Mold in, in all the molt in these feathers here. Well, the white, the white top of the V is 24.7. Top of the V. From the tip to the top mm. of the V. Uh, well, longer lozenge on that one, on the PT5. There might be a bit than on the other. I didn't measure it. And it had miles out, two mils and a bill was a huge mm. amount. Two mils. It doesn't sound a lot, but it doesn't it sound a lot, but on a bird, oh, no, it's, right. it's massive. Autumn, with its rare birds and late insects, gives way to winter. In a 
a typical year, Portland receives about 600 millimetres or 25 inches of precipitation. And in truth, snow and ice are unusual events. If snow does fall, it rarely settles, and even more seldomly remains for more than an hour or two. This small snowstorm was no exception, and the settled snow had gone by evening, thawed by warmer air and the arrival of rain. November can often be Portland's wettest month. Being a limestone massif, the island drains quickly, leaving little standing water. This small waterfall is the runoff from the stream that flows from Colboyle. In winter, the winds can be fierce and often reach gale force. The cliffs are eroded most quickly at this time of the year, and the danger to shipping increases. The wind and waves, though, seem to hold no fears for one of Portland's most specialist birds, the purple sandpiper, who spends the winter on our rocky coast. On the end of the bill, they can often be observed feeding on small mollusks in or around the rock pools, sometimes right at the edge of the spray. In winter, purple sandpipers are at their most recognisable, for in addition to a pronounced plump grey appearance, their short legs and the bases of their bills are bright orange. In excess of 30 birds have wintered on Portland, but recently numbers have declined to below double figures. The sure bird that is perhaps also most typically seen in winter is the oyster catcher. Oyster catchers can be seen all round the island, and one or two pairs breed on the Chesil Beach. But during the winter months, they're perhaps most often found on the clifftop pastures with a rocky shoreline immediately east of the bill. Shorebird researchers on the X have recognised that these large waders are either chiselers or hammerers when it comes to extracting mussels or cockles and their bills are perfectly adapted for either purpose, being formed as vertically flattened blades. In the calm after the storm, here's a young bird, with soft part colours still relatively dull, standing in front of two adults. Although cormorants are commoner around the harbour, they do appear along the coast. This bird has probably come over from the continent, as it appears to be of the race Sinensis. Often winter weather on Portland is very mild, with bright sunshine, and it's not the inhospitable place that might be imagined. The clifftop fields and the rugged coastline make ideal habitats for black red stars. A few water migrants remain for the winter, and they can usually be found in or around the Bill Quarry, on the hut rooftops or in the small coves below the hut fields. In winter, the Bill Road manure heap proves extremely attractive to a large number of bird species. The heat generated by the decomposing matter means that insects are often present both earlier and later in the year than elsewhere on the island. Along with pied wagtails, now in winter plumage, this is also a good place to see the beautiful grey wagtail. This one was present on a daily basis for several weeks. Other birds are attracted to the heat by the presence of grain seeds in the manure, and it's always worth scanning for larks, pipits, buntings, sparrows, thrushes and finches. Unfortunately, the heap itself has now become too large, 
and a great deal of liquid effluent is beginning to run over the cliff edges, polluting the adjoining coastal quarry. A party of turnstones winters in and around Portland Harbour. Here in their well-camouflaged winter plumage, they turn weed and stones in their continuous quest for small crustaceans and mollusks. Their diet is very varied, for in summer they will eat eggs, spiders and any available insect life. The stark scenery of winter still has much to offer, and plants such as Old Man's Beard and Cotoneaster, and the skeletal remains of Teasel and Carline Thistle, remind us of the more prolific months now past. Often best seen in winter, when leaves have fallen revealing bare branches, are lichens, which are often indicators of pollution-free environments. Portland has a considerable variety, and in total over 40 rare lichens feature in Dorset records for Portland. Old, damp elderberry trunks encourage the growth of Hyphodontia sambuci, and in the woods below Pennsylvania Castle, any rotting stump is soon colonised by Trometes versicolor, or many-zoned polypore a highly variably coloured fungus. After more rain, the natural spring in culver oil is in full flow. The ear-shaped fungus known as Jew's ear grows here, on elderberry. The seemingly politically incorrect name is in fact a corruption of Judas ear, after Judas Iscariot, who was thought to have hanged himself on an elder tree. Culverwell's dense cover provides an overwintering site for water rails. At first glance, Portland would seem an unlikely landscape for this timid bird, but one or two do regularly winter, either here or in the observatory garden, which also has the cover and small pools that the species requires. In the bare branches, the old nests of brown-tail moths are visible. Few adult moths emerge in the winter months, but a number can be found if there's a warm spell to bring them out. Having emerged, they may well end up as part of the diet of our robins. perhaps the warmest place to be is indoors. And this house mouse has made its nest in the bottom of a waste paper basket in the bird observatory. This small rodent can enter buildings through cracks or holes no wider than 10 millimetres. Smell and hearing are well developed, but it's doubtful whether it can see much beyond the end of its own nose. Indoors is also the safest place to be for a small mammal when short-eared owls are present. The owls are regular winter visitors and will occasionally remain on the island throughout late autumn and on through to the spring if the vole population is high and there's suitable ground cover for roosting. During 1998-99, two birds remained over winter and were often seen in the air together. In trying to separate short-eared from the similar long-eared owl in flight, look for a white trailing edge to the arm and a darker wingtip with only one bold wingtip bar. Up to two or three long-eared owls occasionally overwinter in the ivy-covered trees and bushes on the slopes of Vern Common, hunting by night over the naval cemetery and adjoining fields. At the turn of the year, much of interest is taking place around the Fleet Nature Reserve. Until recently, little egrets were classified as rarities in Britain, 
but in the past few years their numbers have increased. In the late 1990s birds began to breed along the Dorset coast on Brownsea Island. This bird was filmed early in the morning as it fished in the small tidal pools alongside the car park at Ferry Bridge. Still a rare visitor though is this common seal. This one spent several months in and around the mouth of the fleet at Ferry Bridge. Portland Harbour and the fleet offer chances to many bird watchers to really study seabirds and their behaviour during the winter months. Even though the water of the harbour is relatively calm, this winter plumage little grebe is taking advantage of the shelter offered by the stern of an anchored boat. Much more sturdy, great northern divers regularly winter in small numbers in Portland Harbour. This one is feeding at smallmouth and is probably using a feeding method known as snorkeling, for it regularly dipped its head into the water before diving. The smaller, slimmer shag habitually jumps clear of the water as it dives, a useful identification feature. Small numbers of winter plumage black-necked grebes also winter in the harbour before returning north to breed on shallow inland lakes and pools. Between four and five hundred red-breasted mergansers also spend their winters here, a nationally important number. As the season progresses, they can sometimes be seen performing their odd mechanical courtship displays. The odd thin saw bill has been adapted to hold fish with its serrated edges. Our wintering population of over 3,000 Brenkies is of international importance and confirms the need to conserve the fleet as a nature reserve. The geese usually arrive from their breeding grounds in October and depart by the end of March. At high tide they often gather to rest and preen on the sands close to the visitor's centre at Ferry Bridge. The large flocks are less well ordered than most other geese species and birds call almost constantly. They feed in the shallow waters here where vast underwater meadows of tasselweed and eelgrass are formed, along with over 150 species of seaweed. The geese are often joined by gulls, and here amongst the resident black-headed is a larger second winter Mediterranean gull. Occasionally the pale-bellied form of Brent goose Rota visit the flocks wintering here. There are many ornithologists who now regard the pale-bellied form as a species in its own right. They have pale buff bellies as opposed to the darker bellies of the so-called dark-bellied Brent goose and often remain separate from the main flock. They're not common in Dorset, the British population usually wintering in the northeast or in Ireland. Soon the Brents will head north again, and late winter will have passed into early spring, and our story will nearly have turned full circle. As the days lengthen, the observatory's resident greenfinches respond. Males look almost pristine at this time of the year. They begin to sing again and become more aggressive. A fully grown brown rat will soon clear the observatory bird table. Rats can be found in ever-growing numbers on Portland, particularly around food sources such as the manure heap or next to cafes and houses. In the early spring sunshine, flowers in the garden are beginning to bloom. 
Amongst the earliest is the beautiful Greater Periwinkle. In the shelter of Culverwell, Arums are growing again, alongside the easily overlooked annual Mercury. All across the island, the scenery more and more is taking on the freshness and colours of a new spring. From the blazing yellows of gorse, this patch a survivor from days before the calcareous topsoil was mostly removed, to the first stalks and flowers of hairy bittercress and scurvy grass, growing below the scree and rocks of the west weirs. Over on the eastern side of the island, a carpet of winter heliotrope, an introduction to Britain from the central Mediterranean, is in full flower, providing a valuable source of food for the year's first emerging insects. As too here at Broadcroft Quarry, overlooked by the grim Victorian Borstal building, are these heralds of the new year, the Coltsfoot. It's a flower long used locally to make a form of tea as a remedy for winter coughs and colds. But here it's providing nectar for the first hoverfly of the new spring. In just a few short weeks, the orchids on the bill will be blooming again. The first wheat ears are riding on the cliff slopes, and the skylarks will be in full summer. But never has the balance between the needs of nature and the needs of man been so in danger of breaking down. The Isle of Portland is a very small space, with a great many demands made of it. If the current flora and fauna are to remain and flourish, has to be a limit to the growth and development on the island. There can be no more compromise with vested interest groups. Existing residents and employers must work with voluntary bodies to ensure that their often unique natural world here is protected and that the existing balance holds. It's the natural inheritance of all of us, and all of us must value and protect it. All seemed magical to me, not only because of the natural history interest, with plants I'd never seen before, and the great excitement of the variety of birds that come in migration times, but also because one met such charming people. Everybody seemed happy to be on Portland and to be following their various interests.